Our guest is also recognized as one of the digital era's most exciting innovators and was named as one of the Forbes magazine top 12 most destructive figures in business. This is his first time in Qatar and I am sure you are as eager as I am for him to share his history, his story and insight with us today. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Charles Edmund. talk about a, a, a new chapter, um, which, are there any entrepreneurs in, in the audience? Raise your hand, okay. So a little bit of empathy in the struggle of being an entrepreneur. I'm doing that all over again. So I want to talk a little bit about this moment in time that I'm interested in. Uh, the, the, the moment or the referential for me is this moment of, of expansive creativity, of expansive freedoms for creative people. And when I say creative people, I mean Everything from entrepreneurs, those of us in the audience, to architects. I mean, look at the buildings that we're surrounded by are absolutely stunning and beautiful. To artists, uh, to industrial designers, uh, to chemists, and so forth. People that are bringing new ideas to change the world, right? Looks like anything like this. So if we can, let's, oh, let's go back. Sorry. Okay. So playing with technology, right? Playing with here, bits and bytes, computers and electronics to invent a no, new sort of digitized world. But I think it's, it's also important for us not to forget the things that we're sitting on, right? Old school technology, uh, which looks something like this, right? Which is to say we're still needing to create things the old fashioned way, right? There's sort of a romance to creating things the old fashioned way, and this is another form of creativity. Uh, to, again, thinking about the, how we dress and fashion and expression of another form of, uh, of, of cultural expression and creative freedom. Uh, as much as we want to talk about technology, this is starting to happen in every domain in our, in our world. And I think the, the future that I'm excited about is one that is embracing to all of these characteristics, all of these um, different disciplines, and bringing them all together. So one thing I'll share about myself is um, I'm not a futurist, um, but I do like to think about where we're all going, right? Um, I'm probably more interested in history as an indicator of where we can do things differently, learn from our past, or repeat some of the good things that have been happening uh, before us. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the former. Um, I love history. I want to talk a little bit now about uh, where Kickstarter came from, some of the ideals, if you will, that we had as founders that found their way into what Kickstarter is today, okay? Um, so I'm going to talk about a past that we were all sort of fighting against. Um, anybody familiar with punk rock as a music form? Okay, cool. Uh, so as a little kid, I, I was, uh, if you can kind of paint a picture of, of Charles, I was skateboarding, I was listening to punk rock, listening to electronic music, playing with computers, doing all sorts of weird things, right? And, um, and much of this, especially within the uh, community of, of punk rock and, and music, was about um, being discordant or change, right? Uh, fighting the establishment to create something new. This is very resonant with entrepreneurs, changing the past into the future. And I think the, the past that I want to talk a bit about that was frustrating for me as a creative person supporting other creative people, meaning artists, designers, and so forth, um, was a little bit of this act, this obsession that we had come into, and we're still kind of in, in this moment, which is uh, we have become obsessed with the industrialization of everything, 
right? It's sort of a, a, a dark representation of what that looks like, right? Global warming. But it also starts to look like this, the environments that we've created for work, right? You can easily say that this is probably an environment designed more for robots than humans. And then as a creative, so I'm a designer uh, and an engineer by training. Um, and when I, when I left school in the, in the 90s, I ended up working at a design consultancy. And what I realized as I left that company, as I grew up in that company over a decade, was I felt something like this, right? Like a silly little kitten that was being run by the grown-ups. And what I realized is I was simply just a, a bit of a pawn in someone else's game. Uh, I wasn't really appreciated as a creative, and that was frustrating to me. And so what I'm trying to express a little bit of is a little bit of who's on stage right now, like a little bit of where I come from and how that ego, how that personality fit into what is now today Kickstarter. So the result of this sort of industrialization, this industrialization of everything where it starts out in sort of a manufacturing mindset, we're creating cars, we're creating electronics, but we're also starting to create environments like that last image where creatives are being industrialized. I'll give you an example. Um, hopefully this translates. Anybody familiar with the movie Die Hard? Okay, cool. Uh, so a movie from, from the 1990s, I think. Uh, anybody familiar with the more modern version of that called the Born Identity series? Okay. Same storyline. Decade, maybe 15, 20 years apart. And why, that, why I'm using that as an example is this is a bit of an image of what that represented, which was like, ah, oh, we've seen this story again. They're both amazing movies, they're really fun to watch, but it's the same story. And so in that, where is room for new ideas, creative ideas, ideas that kind of push us forward as a culture, as a community, even as an economy? Um, and we felt more and more, I felt more and more, my co-founders and I felt more and more, that there was less room for creatives to self-express. The world was feeling a little bit more like this image. Same, same, myopic, gray. Uh, we've seen this before. And we wanted a more colorful future for ourselves. And we wanted, ultimately, the creatives around us that were filmmakers and writers and painters and photographers to have an opportunity. The gatekeepers were limiting them having an opportunity and us as an audience having an opportunity to not only support them but see their work. And so that was the backstory in terms of at least the motivations, the emotions, the thing that drove us to build what is now Kickstarter. As we introduced earlier, uh, the platform has seen you know, a distribution of $3 billion across those nine or so years that we've been in existence to over 138,000 projects. Some other stats just to, to add to that, which I think gets into the value of both creativity, the arts, and entrepreneurship is job creation. So there was a study done at the Wharton School, I believe it was the Wharton School, uh, that had computed that there were about 300,000 jobs created from the development of all of those campaigns in the arts, in technology, in design. And that's an astounding number and clearly keeps growing. Certainly a humbling number. So I want to kind of go back again in, in, in this entrepreneurial journey, um, talk a bit about some of those humble beginnings, right? the hard times when we first start out as a, as a platform before we got to $3 billion. And I think there's no better place to start than the very first campaign that got funded on Kickstarter. The numbers are there. I, hopefully everybody can read this, but I'll, I'll give the story. Um, this was literally the first, first project that, that transacted, that met their goal on Kickstarter. This was by a person named Dark Pony. I don't know what this person's real name was, but I'm fascinated by pseudonymity. Uh, this sort of a mystery. Uh, Dark Pony wanted to simply d complete a drawing. This person had drawn a number of drawings their whole life but was frustrated themselves by the fact that they would never finish. A very innocent project. And they felt that through the pressures of economics, meaning uh, I'm going to sell you a drawing, uh, I will have to deliver that drawing. Dark Pony wanted to raise $15, d do three drawings, $5 a piece. Uh, clearly blew the doors off of that campaign with a total of $35. So the very first Kickstarter campaign raised $35 from three people. Moving on a couple of months, um, singer-songwriter, a uh, woman named Allison Weiss. Uh, interestingly, she was studying graphic design in the middle of uh, the United States. But on the side, she had 
um, built up a passion for music and was sharing her music online, on Tumblr, on YouTube, and so forth. She'd built up this like, really small but dedicated audience. She launched her campaign on a Thursday morning, I believe it was, uh, and she wanted to raise a total of $2,000 just to fund, fund an album. Again, kind of get her work out, in, out into the world, not go through the, the traditional system of, of a label. And what was astounding about this, this was only a few months later from, from Dark Pony's project, um, was the fact that within 24 hours, maybe even 12 hours, she had completely raised the $2,000. So imagine $35 to $2,000. We, we knew we were kind of on to something at this point, right? People were starting to raise a little bit more. And what was interesting is the speed at which she raised that capital was fascinating. And then she began to teach us things. And I think this is interesting for any entrepreneur in, in, in the audience, thinking about the, the strength of the product that you're creating and being a attentive, att paying a lot of attention to how people are using the product that you're creating and then learning from that experience, learning from that exchange. And so what, what Allison taught us is how do you keep an audience going and supporting your project even though you're fully funded, right? We saw that with, with Dark Pony a little bit, $15 to $35, but she went on to raise $7,000. And she was being, being very playful and communicative and having a lot of fun with her audience, which then got the audience to simply propel her project even further, tell other people about it. Um, so word of mouth and social media. Um, so I think being mindful of the products that we put out into the market and under understanding what we can learn from them. Technology is a brilliant thing, isn't it? Beep boop. OK, cool. So Pebble, anybody familiar with Pebble? A lot of people familiar. Anybody wearing a Pebble? Nobody, but everybody. Ah, one person in that, cool. So. Um, the story with Pebble, this is going from humble beginnings to maybe not so humble beginnings, but there's a really interesting story behind Pebble. I'll, I'll sort of spill the beans a little bit here. Um, the folks behind per Pebble, Eric and his team, uh, had actually gone on to raise, uh, fund three different products on the platform. This is the second. The first one started out as a couple thousand dollars. They wanted to raise enough capital to build a prototype to then um, build an, uh, a bunch more test the market, prove the, the market for an e-connected watch. This was previous to Apple coming up with their uh, Apple Watch. Um, first campaign went on to raise $10 million. So now we're talking about $35 to $7,000 to $10 million. The second project that they, they went to raise, which was for this one, uh, went on to raise beep, boop, beep, 20 mil whoop, let's go back, $20 million. OK, cool. $20 million. They went on to raise another round of capital uh, on the platform about a year, year or two later for an addition to the, to the watch, another $13 million. So what, what's interesting about this is the elastic nature of the platform. And this is just simply the concept of a platform is that it can kind of expand and contract. All right, so let's go to, to uh, Amanda Palmer, another musician. Uh, what's interesting about Amanda, I think the story here is simply the fact that she already was in the industry. She was a musician, she had a label that she was represented by, but she was frustrated in terms of her creative constraints within the label. She wanted to kind of move in a different direction musically, and she removed herself, she fired the label, and she went independent. And she wanted to get back in touch with her audience and felt that her audience would come along with her, even though the label wouldn't. And so this is a little bit of that punk rock, kind of fighting the establishment, making a change, because you know that in your heart you want to push something forward in a different direction. Creatively, you want to go in a different direction. You know some portion of people will come along with you. And what was amazing about this campaign is people came along with her. She ended up raising just shy of $2 million, one of the highest raising music projects on, on the site, at least at the time, uh, and went on to tour and, and has now continued to be independent and carving her own path. Again, getting back to this creative independence. All right, last story on the, on the Kickstarter front before we switch. I think this goes back to something um, really near and dear to my heart, which is about humility and about culture and community, right? Something bigger than just the capital that gets exchanged between creator and their fan base. So these are five kids, boys, in middle school and high school, young boys. And the thing that they wanted to build, uh, this thing called the Viper, what they were funding for, was the development of a flight simulator. 
I don't know what you were doing in middle school and high school, um, but I definitely wasn't thinking of building a flight simulator. These are clearly some very smart, driven, uh, ambitious, maybe a little crazy boys. And what's amazing about this campaign is five little boys put out a bold statement and 383 people supported them with $11,000. One little fun fact, I've run a couple of Kickstarter campaigns, I've not even raised $11,000. Uh, so a little humble statement. What I think is beautiful about this, this project is less so about the campaign itself. It's amazing in and of itself. What I think is more powerful is what happens next for them. And what I mean by that is the small amounts of, of cash that people gave them turns into what for them? Instantly it turns into courage, a communication of courage. Where can these people go? Like where can these kids go? confidence in their uh, creative pursuit and their bold ideas, courage. And I think there's something far more interesting than any of that, and that is this transference of love. That capital is this conduit for something far more powerful that is community and love, right? And so what I wonder is what, where, how can these kids, one of them, all five of them, whatever, change the world in the future? How, what do they get to invent beyond the flight simulator down the road by virtue of the confidence that they got from this 383 people supporting their bold idea. How are we on time? Beep, boop. All right. So a new chapter. Um, we'll talk about this quickly. Um, I left Kickstarter at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Um, and if you can kind of pick up anything about me, I'm fascinated by the creative act but the, the sort of chaotic experience that creatives go through. And I was interested in how can I continue to support them? I looked back at my life, at side projects and, and profession, and tried to figure out what were the things that were really important to me, that gave me value personally, uh, in terms of my heart, um, that I also felt were problems in the world, right? So with Kickstarter, it was about capital and community. We felt that cr creatives, creators, um, didn't have access to capital, and needed that, that capital to create their project, and they would only do that through the support of a community. And so I was very interested in seeing what other facets of the creative process follow the story of Sisyphus. Anybody familiar with the story of Sisyphus? Forever pushing a rock up the hill for the rock to fall down. That feels like the creative act, right? Everything's constantly fighting against you. And what I realized in my travels, similar to travels to Qatar, was that one of the major difficulties was pre-Kickstarter, meaning pre-coming to Kickstarter and funding your, your project, you needed to find a place to create the project, whether it was a digital product or a physical product. Most co-working spaces, most, most incubators are focused on software, and as an individual, I'm focused in a broad range of, of communities around creativity. And I think the things that, were, that seemed to be lacking for me, for them, for creatives, was access to tools, advanced tools to create, right? Uh, access to adequate space to create within. And what I would say is ac actual access to a community of other ambitious creative people that would share knowledge amongst each other. And so what I had done is um, experimented with this, this concept of building a space for ambitious creatives. It's called Lost Arts. It's the new endeavor that I'm working on. And um, in thinking about where this was going to go, the vision for the future was a network of spaces globally, right, that fit into certain geographies that felt like there was enough of a creative community um, that also had a gap in terms of their access to, to tools, space, and knowledge. But that felt very um, difficult to achieve. I didn't want to build the end result, but I wanted to, to, to play a little bit. I wanted to find out, is anybody else interested in what I'm, what I'm thinking in my head? And so I started following, anybody familiar with the Lean Startup methodology? A few people should, I hope, okay. Uh, and so I started following this simple process of how do I make this thing smaller, simpler, fun? How do I get out faster? Um, so probably many of you are familiar with the concept of proof of concept. Um, so if I'm imagining a 30,000 square foot facility uh, in the city of Chicago, I started out with a 4,000 square foot facility, right? In a space that was a, previously a food factory uh, so it was a pretty gross building. You can see it here. City of Chicago, the Sears Tower in the background. 
I did this for a month, call it performance art. Invited 60 people from around the city, equaling these different disciplines that I was interested in supporting, surrounded by tools that would allow them to transact their idea in their head into an object. It was amazing, it was super fun. The only data that I was looking for was some sort of interest from the community to come back, right? Closed it after a month, the usual sort of response was like, hey Charles, when are you gonna do that again? Because that was awesome. And I missed the people that I was around. And that gave me motivation enough to try again. And so we moved from a proof of concept, a very experimental space that's just temporary, giving me some time to reflect on it, to a prototype, something that now has 10,000 square feet, actually has windows, the first place had no windows. Uh, August in Chicago is very similar to Qatar, uh, unbearable heat. Uh, and so imagine being in a space unair conditioned with a bunch of tools and people working and sweating. Uh, that was the first space. The second space was a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more refined. Um, and so it was a building block. We ran this experiment for six months. In the first version, nobody paid me anything. They were all my guinea pigs. In the second version, people paid me. I wanted to get a better understanding of economics and operations. How do you actually run the facility? And amazing things actually happened over the course of that year. Um, we wanted to run it for six months. We ended up running it, the experiment for a year. Here's a couple that uh, husband and wife pair industrial designers, product designers inventing a new product that actually connected back with my past, the previous part of the presentation. Uh, they raised $250,000 on Kickstarter. And so now you start seeing the real world weaving into the virtual world and leveraging different forms of technology to create new, a new future. Uh, we saw things like industrial designers creating things for food to um, using 3D printers to prototype game pieces for a board game, which is also very big on Kickstarter to uh, another game piece, which was this is an uh, internet connected device that uses the world around us, the sort of built environment to, cre to uh, create a game. Um, so this is a designer and entrepreneur in, ch in Chicago. Cool. To nonprofit. So this is a um, public art project in Chicago called the Wabash Lights. Wabash is a industrial street in Chicago. And the concept here is to create a public art piece. What you're seeing in the background is sort of an experiment of that. These LED lights that, that run underneath the above ground subway uh, and bring art to the public that can then interact with the art and start teaching programming and technology through the act of, of playing with art. So we're back at this, this concept of that punk rock kid sort of rules we're always meant to be broken, right? That was just sort of our mandate and our charge. So I'm a little bit older now, not quite as punk rock as I might have been when I was 16. Um, I'm now in my 40s and we soften up a little bit as we get into our 40s. But there was a, an abstraction of this idea that I thought was really interesting in this age of technology and speed and, how, and the rate of change that, that things are going, right? And I think usually this rate of change is, is spoken about in fear. We, in the introduction, uh, said that I was you know, uh, the disruptive figure, um, which means I was just a rude little boy in the back of the class, which generally speaking, I wasn't. Um, and I think the, the reflection here was you know, not being this bad boy, not being this, this uh, counterculture person, but thinking about that rate of change in a more embracing way, a softer way, a more elegant way which was the fact that every one of us has a part to play in that change. And there's, a, there's a, an embracing of that which I think empowers us to just experiment more. And the edit to that was the fact that the rules were always temporary. The difference is now they change so much quicker, which empowers us to just put our ideas out there, right? To test whether somebody else out there believes in what you believe in, right? And so I think as, as the introduction went, coming back to that, just this development or support of culture, the culture around entrepreneurship, right, globally and here in Qatar, kind of plays onto this, which is let's not be afraid of that future, but let's let play into that future, maybe lean into that future a little bit and allow more and support more experimentation with technology for the sake of humanity and culture. Thank you very much. How did I do on time? Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that is right now. Um, thank you, Charles, very much. Um, we're going to break the break for 20 minutes. The university is outside. 
ولو في اي حد محتاج ترجمه في سيتس للترجمه موجوده على الباب اتفضلوا uh, we'll stop for 20 minutes for a prayer break and we convene back right after for the questions and answers thank you very much we now go to the second part of the evening the questions and answers there's a snapchat filter in case anyone wants to use it um, on stage we have the ceo of cubic mrs aisha al mudahka All right, okay. And we have Charles again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adil. Just open my phone for some questions. Okay. I'm, How are you? I'm, I'm okay, and yeah, you? I'm good. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's yeah. inspiring. It's, it's, it's amazing uh, to see the transformation from, you know, The crowdfunding to actually starting something as well and start making something with creative, talented people. I think this is really inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. I do have a few questions, and I'm sure after my questions, uh, we will open it to the uh, to the audience um, for also Q and A. So my first question is, why would you want to start a business? What's the drive? Mm. Um. I think for me, uh, the, the drive is about seeing a future that looks different than today and wanting to at least attempt to, to see if that's valid, right? Um, I think it's also just a simple act of creativity, right? And I think I, I, I would say this now post Kickstarter, and I say that only because You know, as a kid, I never had a dream of being an entrepreneur. I didn't even know what that word was. Even in engineering school, I didn't really know what business was, was something you went to a different school for, right? Um, and so I call myself an accidental entrepreneur, right? I just happened to meet some two guys that um, were working on this idea that um, compelled me to start the company with them. Um, and it was because I, too, shared the vision for that future that they, that they saw. Um, and that was, for me personally, I think, again, you see the thread in, in um, the work that I do and the thing that, that drives me is about seeing people do their best work, right? Or at least attempt to do their best work. Um, and supporting those kind of young designers, entrepreneurs, creatives, and at least having some um, make a different shape for the world. Um, and so for me, it seems a little crazy that I'm leaving one company that's doing amazingly well to then go attempt another one and find those kind of humble beginnings again, which are very strenuous and difficult. Uh, but I can, you know, in my 40s, say this one thing, which is um, you only live once. Uh, and so live that life as best as you can. Uh, and for me, like leaving a legacy that um, I was able to, sounds a little bit trite at times, but leave a little bit of a dent in the world. Maybe it looks a little bit different uh, than when I came into it. Yeah, and yeah. How much would you follow your, pa uh, when, you, when you start a business, how mm. much would you follow your own passion and drive to it? And how much would you follow versus um, the market trend and what's going on in the market and so on? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I tend not to pay too much attention to like trends in the market, right? Because that's that's a bit of today, um, <clears throat> and depending on where uh, in the trend you play, um, you might get lost in uh, the distractions of the market, right? There's a lot of experiments going on, uh, and so. Maybe I can describe it this way. This actually gets back to the early days of, of Kickstarter. Um, so when we had launched, we launched the site on April 28th of 2009. And there was two or three or four years leading up to it that we were developing the site. <clears throat> And in that time, uh, there were other competitors that were launching, um, some that still exist and some that don't exist. And if we had paid attention to the market, Um, we would have been distracted by things that, and maybe followed things that um, weren't doing well, right? There are all these experiments in this kind of nascent market called crowdfunding. And so what I mean by that is um, the three of us, we followed our passion or our thesis, right? Um, which is a particular, say, kind of narrative with, within the product that was different than some of our competitors. 
Uh, and there was a very distinct moment when a new competitor had launched. We hadn't, again, we hadn't launched yet. And we start, started to kind of dissect their platform. And I had a very visceral kind of physical reaction saying like, we've got to stop paying it this close attention because we're going to change our own mindset. And we're going to start reflecting a bit of their thinking and not put our own unique thinking, our own unique spin on what we were doing. And I wanted to make sure that when we went out to market that um, we at least had a fighting chance to test out our, our original passion, our original thesis. So I think you have to like, lead with the vision that you start with. But then as you get into, mar into market, I think there's this dance. We were talking about it a little bit before with Allison Weiss and being observant of how people are utilizing or not using um, your product or your platform. Um, and so I think in that, as an entrepreneur, as a creative, you want, I think, nothing more than for somebody to appreciate what you're doing. Um, and so I think in that is this idea of product market fit, right? Um, finding resonance or a connection to your community. Um, and so first you start with your passion, and then you've got to pay attention to your community. Yeah. And what do you think we should do first? Do you think we should focus on the, um, to try to get the right funding, or should we focus mm. on the idea itself? Yeah, so I think uh, the idea, I, I, I should admit this one thing. I'm a designer and, an, and uh, a wannabe engineer. Um, and, um, and so from my point of view, and I, you know, a product person, I care very deeply about the, the product as a representation of an idea for people, right? And so um, my bias is to focus on the product, right? Um, just utmost respect for what you're building and who you're building it for, right? Um, and really, I would say even maybe more so than that, between funding and the product is people and really having an obsession for the people that you're producing the product for, right? Very deeply understanding them uh, so that you can reflect that understanding into the product. But again, it comes back to the product. And I think only once you've figured the product out, then funding can actually play an important role. If funding is about not only sustaining you through uh, the unsustainable period, but also in scale, right? And so if you've not spent an inordinate amount of energy on the product. If you go to scale uh, a product before it's figured out, um, that could lead to a significant amount of disaster. So if that's the case, how do, we fund our, how do you fund yourself as a startup? Yeah, so I think um, <clears throat> you know, within the ecosystem, there's something called angel investors, right? People who are maybe investing for the spirit of uh, what you're building. Um, it's their own personal capital. It's not managed by a fund manager. The expectations are a little bit different. Uh, and the analysis is a little bit different. Um, and so I think, you know, just generally speaking, any company that you have seen somewhere in its history has probably had an angel um, or they bootstrapped, right? Uh, and what I would say to that is like the angels are generally uh, the unsung hero, right? It's the, it's the community of people that believe in the entrepreneur and believe in the product um, and believe in the idea that change is possible. Um, and so finding those individuals is really important. Okay, I want to ask a little bit about, um, you know, customer validation in general. So yeah. in Kickstarter, uh, you do have the platform of communication with the, especially at the beginning, even if yeah. it's in just an idea without even, like pre-selling, there's a pre-selling stage at Kickstarter. Yeah. So what do you think of that, like talking to customers before even selling your product? Yeah, um, you know, so I think for one, what I would say is before you even have a product, you see that there's a gap, right? Um, and I think that gap is a, is a reflection of community or culture or people. And what you're filling, again, filling the gap is with something to, that in, enhances someone's life in some way. Um, and so I think within the construct of Kickstarter and getting some validation, if you will, again, whether it's a film or, a, or an album, you know, music album or work of art or a product, 
is there's always this dialogue. I mean, it goes back to Alison Weiss again, and the dialogue that she was having through the use of video, through blog posts. So within, the, within Kickstarter, every project, every campaign uh, has something called project updates, which is effectively a blog, right? And, and it's a storytelling device. It's a storytelling of um, the story pre, like while you're funding, but also what's actually almost more important is the story once you've been funded, right? and sharing the story of getting that idea into the hands of the community that has supported you. Um, and I think that story is really important in humanizing that process, but I think it's also a moment of dialogue, right? Um, I think there's some, there's some really amazing examples of, you know, projects often find uh, that, they, that they deliver a reward a little bit later or a lot later uh, than, they, than they had expected. It's kind of the the typical entrepreneurial experience, meaning I really wish we had launched two years ago, but I ran into a problem. Either our developers quit, or my co-founder left, or, or, um, <clears throat> or we ran into a stumbling block, we couldn't raise capital. Uh, whatever the case may be, there's some, always something that delays us. Uh, and so I think open and active communication is a great way to build empathy and community with, with your audience, and they come to support you, right? Much like an investor would, much like an angel would. Uh, and so I think al along that whole process is being open and communicati communicative and humble and curious. Maybe that's a bigger thing is just curiosity for like, why, why are you even interested in the thing that I'm making, right? And once you hear why, then you hear a little bit more of the, well, what do you use it for? What's your, what is your goal in life that you're, that you're using this thing that I'm seeing as a gap? Um, so I think, you know, in validation, it's more than just validating, but it's also a, uh, a moment where you can have an, uh, a very honest and open conversation, particularly early on, um, with the few individuals that are backing your, your project. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we've noticed that even with our you know, incubatees and our startups here, so the more they interact at an early stage, yeah. uh, the more they have market traction and they get earlier sales. Uh, than you know the ones who are not. So, there, yeah. There's a there's a really interesting story that I think expresses what, what we're both de describing and uh, the founding of Airbnb. Yeah. Everybody familiar with Airbnb? Yeah, cool. Um, great company, awesome founders, and um, they went through Y Combinator, some similar accelerator in in California. And Paul Graham, who uh, started Y Combinator, had asked uh, uh, Brian and Joe, "Well, do you have any?" people using the platform, where are your users? Right? Where's your audience? Uh, and they say, well, what do you mean? They're on the website. And say, no, no, no. Where are they? Like, oh, there, there's, a, there's a community of people in New York. Not very many, but there's some in New York. It's like, well, why, why are you here? Why aren't you in New York? It's like, well, I, what do you mean? Go to your customers, right? Yeah. And the point was, go be intimate with them, spend time with them, talk to them, understand why, they're, why are they using Airbnb, right? Yeah. And it was world-changing for Brian and Joe to travel to New York and spend time with them because they learned all of not only the, uh, these, the problems that they were solving for some of these um, users of Airbnb, um, but they also understood a little bit more of, I mean, they, they even got product suggestions, like, hey, the site should be doing X, Y, and Z. And so you never actually know um, what you're going to learn just some, from spending time with and getting out of your office, yeah. right? Thank you so much. So yeah. we'll open it to uh, our great audience. Please. We have. <coughs> Hi, thanks, Charles, for your uh, nice panel discussion and your uh, that speaker series. So I have one general question and one personal question. My general question is like here in Qatar after the, after the blockade happened. Um, how can we create an innovative community mindset to increase the innovative inventions and to let Qatar be self-sufficient? Mm -hmm. That's one part. The second part, for me, as a personal question, as an entrepreneur, I'm always searching for problems to solve mm -hmm. that, that I'm passionate about. To let it, uh, so I need your advice, like uh, this idea. Yeah. What's the best way to get like, the, my passion and the, to solve my, the, the problem? So let me ask a question back. You said blockade. Can you explain blockade? Yeah, I was telling you that 
Oh, the embargo we're yeah, talking the embargo. about. Oh my gosh, I don't even know. Um, you repeat that first question a okay. little bit more. So, <laughs> yeah. my so, memory is not so good, right? Uh, okay, yeah. so after the lock it happened, yeah. um, how can we create an innovative community mindset mm. to increase the innovative inventions and to let Qatar be more self-sufficient? So I, I think one thing that, that um, is fun to think about with regard, at least if we're talking about the internet, right, digital products, um, is the fact that it's borderless, right? Um, so, okay, there's a political uh, embargo on Qatar from other places in the region. Um, the reality is that may not represent individuals in those countries, right? And so the power that I would say the internet provides us all is to connect as individuals and kind of work around these restraints or constraints that governments put on uh, countries, right? Um, and so maybe the, the constraint, the embargo, isn't such a big deal. Now, I'm not, from here, I'm not living within it, so I'm, I'm maybe oversimplifying it. Um, I think there's another layer to this. So, so maybe it's not as much of an issue. Maybe it doesn't become as much of a hindrance. Um, I think there's another layer to this, which is, okay, let's think beyond just the region, right? How do you build something that is, um, accessible and relatable to people beyond just Qatar and the region. Um, and something that, that appeals globally, right? Um, again, kind of thinking bigger than um, just the simple geography that we're in. Um, I guess that would be my, my reflection. On the personal front, um, I, I think all I can talk about is um, maybe how I got to the second idea, right? Um, so in Leading up to leaving Kickstarter, um, I'll, I'll set the stage a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm married, I have a daughter, and I had a dog. Uh, and um, we were moving from New York to Chicago, right? Um, I knew I wanted to uh, leave New York and just see, have a different surrounding. I, I, I like moving and changing surroundings quite a bit, b being a bit nomadic. Um, and, and so my daughter had to start school, so my wife had to move before I could move. I still had to unravel myself from the company. That gave me a little bit of freedom, right? Which meant I get to go to bars and coffee shops alone when I should have been spending time with my family. Um, and I went armed into those bars and coffee shops alone with, with a pencil and a notebook, right? And that time was just to look back on my life and say, what were those things that were passionate for me that I didn't do for money? I didn't care about that. I mean, I care about feeding my family and feeding myself, but um, more so like what was the thing that, was, that would drive me in my life? Um, and then I started writing some ideas down, whatever, right? Uh, and, and I think that the next step, once I was out of the company and had this kind of freedom, if you will, um, I traveled a lot. And I spent time with artists and designers and other entrepreneurs um, just hanging out, talking, right? Reconnecting and trying to get a sense of well, now that I've, I've spent eight, nine years doing Kickstarter, um, now what's, what, what does the world look like? Kickstarter changed the world. All the world has kind of moved on in and of itself. Um, and so where were those gaps, right? Um, and that wasn't even taking into account whether there was a business in there. It was just saying, like, is there a problem that I can solve? And then as we get into the, um, the second part of the presentation, talking about the tests, like lean startup kind of methodology, was um, before I dove into one of those ideas, I wanted to make sure that other people were committed to that same idea, that they subscribed to my thesis, my theory. Um, because there's one thing about entrepreneurship I think you'd agree with is it's, um, it's horrible, right? It's brutal, it's very difficult, right? Yeah, hallelujah. Uh, and, um, and so before I, I went and did that again, I wanted to make sure what I was doing was something that spoke to my heart and that other people could relate to, and ultimately that it would be fun, right? Because there's moments where it's really not fun, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's a reflection, but look inside and then look outside, and then just play a little bit. Thank you very much. Um, two quick Questions. First, why did you leave start, uh, Kickstarter? Why did I start or leave? Why did you leave it? Mm. And uh, the second question is um, a bit about the methodology. 
Um, you know, beyond finding a problem and solving it from yeah. an entrepreneurial point of view, how useful uh, do you find the uh, job to be done theory in practice? Mm. Is this something that, how much traction does it have? Are there any tools? Um, you know, if you can just uh, illuminate yeah. that uh, part. So we'll, we'll do thinking. the first one first. Okay. Um, everyone seems to have two questions. I've got to hold my memory bank. Um, why did I leave? Uh, you know, I think there was, there was this reflection for me. Um, literally, I was turning 40 at the time. That's a moment of reflection, right? Um, and, uh, and part of that reflection was like, hey, look at what we have accomplished. Um, but then this other wonder, which was like, OK, what else? Maybe going to your second point, what other jobs are there to be done, right? How do we continue to push the boundaries of empowering creatives, right? What was the thing that kind of filled my heart, right? Uh, and I would say it's, it wasn't an easy process. Like, Kickstarter might be the most amazing thing I ever work on, right? Um, I hope not, right? Um, but that was a very difficult and emotional process, but one that I, I was committed to. Um, and I think it was just mostly out of a curiosity of like, what else could, could, could I do, right? Um, getting into the jobs to be done uh, narrative. Um, I've talked to a few folks that were actually responsible for that theory. I don't remember the, the, the core details of it. Um, so I'm not that astute on, on the narrative, but I definitely subscribe to the, the idea, which is looking at the world as, and looking at companies as tools right, to empower a job, uh, some job that somebody needs to accomplish. And how do you fit into that narrative? I think that's when I heard the, the sort of foundations of that concept of uh, the jobs to be done, it spoke to me because it was innate, kind of natural to how I look at the world anyway. Um, so it's probably a theory that I always subscribed to but didn't have words for. They articulated it much better. Um, but I think that's the thing, like going and looking at the world and um, I don't think innately looking for you know, something to disrupt or, or what have you, but looking at things maybe a little bit more pragmatically and humbly and saying, here's something that somebody's trying to do and there's some friction in the process. And how do we make that process a little bit more frictionless, right? Um, and I would argue that's the, you know, if Kickstarter was part of that experiment, the friction was about capital as a, as a mechanism to get people from an idea into uh, a, a made thing uh, or a made experience. Um, Lost Arts is a second step to that, is providing them with a different platform with a different set of tools that another, again, enables them to get a bit closer to bringing that idea from your head into, into the world. Um, helpful? Good? Yeah? OK, cool. More, more questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, Charles, for your time. Um, during your presentation, you said that for a decade, you worked like a kitten in the, yeah. in the office and that, yeah. And then after that, you just um, uh, chose the words to describe yourself as um, uh, um, 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 I mean, an accidental entrepreneur. Yeah. If you had that spirit, that rebel spirit, that rule-breaking spirit mm. from the beginning, why did it take you so long to make that jump? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm glad other people it, are laughing too. <laughs> was yeah. it the team, finding the right team, yeah. the thing that made you jump, or the idea itself? Oh, the guts stop doing it. Yeah, je ne sais quoi. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll try to answer the question. You know, I think, um, so let me paint the picture a little bit. When I was, when I was that kitten in the corporation, right, um, I, was also have, I was also doing some side projects. And it was those side projects that informed uh, my gut, right, when I was on the phone with Perry. So Perry, Yancey, and myself started the company. Perry was the, the root of Kickstarter, right? It was him who had stumbled into an issue that invented the idea, and Perry, Yancey, and I kind of evolved that idea. Um, and I remember very distinctly being on the phone with uh, Perry in uh, 2006 or 2007, December, January, that period of time. Um, and him, uh, are you guys familiar with the elevator pitch concept, right? So this was not an elevator pitch, right? It's more, of a, more like my answers here today, like a story, right? And I, I very distinctly remember interrupting Perry and pausing him and saying, I get it. I, I think I got it, right? And my point there being, um, 
I saw the future that he saw because I had already been playing with it. But I was doing it wrong. And the, the solution that he was thinking about was far more compelling and sustainable I, in my head. Um, and I should admit, admit this one thing, which was at the time I, so I left that eight large company to go start my own studio. So maybe that was the first kind of entrepreneurial act. Um, and then ironically, I'd actually joined another startup on the side, very quickly realized that was going to go nowhere. Um, and it was around that time when I met Perry and heard this idea, and I was like, that's interesting, right? Um, and so I think maybe going back to your question, was it him, was it Perry, was it the idea? I mean, it was definitely the idea. But I only was able to understand that idea by doing these other side projects. And so it very much connected with a future that I, that I appreciated. Uh, so uh, first of all, I want I want to I would like to uh, thank you, Charles, for being with us today, and I want to pass a special thank to Mrs. Aisha Mudahika and all the team of Cubic for doing such a great job inspiring all the young entrepreneurs here at Qatar. And I have one single question for you. Actually, I'm one of your fans, and I am highly I highly always admire the people who are trying to disrupt industries and everything. So my question to you, did the old system, which is the old way of doing like funding projects, mm. like going to the bank, taking a loan and everything, did they fight you when you are trying to like revolutionize this, this way of funding? And if mm. they fight you, how did you fight back? Even mm. though I know like in the US, it's a free market and it's like free competition and everything. Yeah. But I really want like to know like how can we fight back against the industries that we are trying to disrupt. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because we see this sort of like antagonistic image in the background, right? Um, or it looks antagonistic, right? Um, and maybe a bit of what you're describing. I, I use the Berlin Wall, which is, this is the Berlin Wall behind us, right? Uh, and this punk rock woman in this community around her like finally busting the wall down. It's a little bit of an, ex, an expression, an artful expression of what you're talking about. And yet the reality is like it doesn't, it, it's not necessarily that antagonistic. Like it's something far more um, subtle or humble, which is like, hey, we just want, we see the world in a different way, and why don't we just connect the dots, disintermediate, right? Um, I can't say that there was a fight with the banks or the VCs. In, instead, I think we become just another option, right? Or an alternative or an enhancement to the options that creatives have. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, I remember meeting with a, a filmmaker, and this actually relates back to the um, story with Pebble, as well as the story uh, with uh, Amanda Palmer, leaving her record label, right? <laughs> Wanting more creative freedom. Um, but there was, uh, oh my God, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, oh, this filmmaker uh, had gone and pitched her film to the industry, right? To film houses. Nobody would take her call. Why? Because she wasn't established yet. She, wasn't, she was a new and up, upcoming uh, filmmaker. And this is a story that was you know, in history forever. right? Nobody knew who she was. She didn't have the connections. Um, she ran her film, uh, funded it on, on Kickstarter. Uh, and I met her over a dinner in New York. It was uh, film week in New York. And the next day, she was meeting with uh, one of those producers. right? Why? Because she going back to the question earlier, validated that her idea resonated with an audience, right? Before that, unknown, right? Uh, the incumbent, the industry was taking a big bet, and they were generally risk averse. And so by virtue of having an audience that was already interested in what she was doing, she proved that, that, that her idea was valid. Um, it showed that there was a market, showed that there was a community interested in her story. It becomes less risky. Um, and so I don't know that it's so much about um, a fight, but maybe a compliment, right? Um, good. Yeah. Any more questions? Hi. Your uh, name? My name is Adam El Barawi, and I'm part of uh, Cubic Clean Startup Program. Uh, my question is. Um, like, if you could travel time, uh, today <laughs> one, you started the Kickstarter, what mistakes like you would have avoided? <sighs> what mistakes would I have avoided? Um, None, maybe? <laughs> I 
You know, I, I, I think, um, I don't know that we would have done anything differently. And it's hard, it, why I say that is maybe the simple thing is the, the trials and tribulations that we, went, that we went through, and there were many, um, even through all that, the platform became incredibly successful. Um, and, I, and I answer in that way because I think um, each moment, like the reflection of these competitors launching while we had still not launched, right? Uh, and the reflection back to, um, well, what are, our, what are our ideals and how do we hold true to those ideals? If we had, if I had done things differently, if instead of it taking two years to launch and it took six months, which is, you know, in the playbook of startups should have been six months, um, I don't know if we would have been successful because each of those little trouble spots uh, informed our gut, informed our decision. Um, yeah, so I don't think I would do anything differently. Even through all the hardship, I wouldn't have wanted to make it any easier. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. It's uh, very nice uh, that you shared with us your experience. It's uh, lovely and uh, inspiring. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I wanted to ask you something. Mm. Because um, you are dealing with the idea that, be, that is becoming a project. Mm -hmm. And you are enhancing it and giving it support to us to come to life. How about people who are dealing with the human beings mm. and uh, giving them this, uh, give them this ability and capability of uh, giving ideas mm. or producing ideas, which is, yani, I mean, the youth, the very young youth between 15. Children, you mean? No, between 12 and 14 or okay. 15. Uh, you know, I, I work with these, um, uh, the poor people or the refugees or something like this. Uh, actually, the investment is not now. Yeah. It's about uh, it's 10 years. Yeah. And uh, how, uh, so how can you um, uh, uh, let others believe uh, on this, because mm. you, they can't see it. Yeah. It's only a human being, and this human is going to be uh, to live another life because you helped him to be in, uh, uh, any good ideas, um, in, uh, um, you know, what is creativity? Some people even you don't know what's uh, social responsibility, totally. what's uh, uh, investing in uh, your uh, community. How can you help uh, these poor uh, uh, places that you are dealing with? So um, it's important that we know how to uh, attract the attentions of these investors who believe in the future as yeah. want to change. Uh, and uh, it's actually, uh, we don't want just a change. We want a change for the better. Yeah. More human, more uh, 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 manners. You know, We don't want uh, people to fight and lose uh, energy for nothing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, it's not a simple answer. And I don't think technology fixes what you're describing, right? Um, nor do I necessarily think that cash or investors, like let's use that word for a minute, might be the wrong mechanism, right? Because an investor, it's a loaded word. Um, an investor is putting money behind something to get a return of some kind. And um, perhaps in the ecosystem or the community that you're talking about, the outcome might be a little bit different, right? Uh, is it a grant, right, uh, that supports uh, somebody with a dream, right, uh, that wants to change maybe just their own life or their family's life, right, to be sustainable for themselves? And what I think is it interesting, there was a, there was a company um, in Chicago that was kind of taking the crowdfunding mechanism and applying it to the community that you're talking about. It's called Benevolent. Um, and um, didn't quite have the, the, the traction that Kickstarter had, but taking that same mindset and providing um, you know, sort of the crowdfunding concept to a different community. Um, and I think that's an interesting example simply in the sense that um, it's worked, but it hasn't scaled incredibly, right? And so there's more, if we can get back to it, like there's more job to be done, there's more of a job to be done in that, in that, in that realm. Um, and maybe crowdfunding wasn't the right mechanism, uh, or maybe uh, it was the wrong kind of expression of, of, um, of a product, right? Um, and so, I, you know, I think the, the other piece is like the, 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 
the communities that you serve, the, pro the, the solution may not be the same for one community as for another, right? Uh, and so I think it, there just needs to be a lot of experimentation, right? And I think we need to be open to that experimentation to play. Um, I'll give you a, a different way to tell the story. Um, anybody familiar with Twitter? Facebook? Right? Foursquare, Kickstarter, all of these things. Um, I describe them as social experiments, right? They're all experiments, right? They don't become anything until people are using it, right? What, you don't, what you've probably never heard of is this thing called Pounce, right? So Pounce uh, was a competitor to Twitter, right? Uh, they were kind of neck and neck, and eventually Pounce dropped out of the race, right? And why I say that as important is there was clearly a, a race going on and an experiment. Both were, had a different thesis around communication, right? Um, Kickstarter wasn't the first crowdfunding platform. There was a thing called Fundable, which had launched th three years before us, a different social experiment. Uh, and so if we can apply maybe that kind of thinking into a different domain, which is more you know, in support for children with a dream that want to um, maybe get out of poverty or, or, um, or off welfare or whatever the case may be, I think a different maybe the same application of kind of lean startup methodologies or this sort of startup attitude could get applied into that, into that community. Yeah. Hi, Charles. Uh, Sajid here. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the wonderful session. So uh, I have one question, and rather one question and one suggestion that I'm looking for from you. So I run a startup that is on e-learning, OK? So we are into a decent revenue generation phase. And uh, we are working from one year, okay? Now, since I want to integrate it to different label and I want to reach to more audience, okay? Mm. So at this point of time, what will you suggest? Uh, should I go for, uh, like, again, bootstrap? Since I started with bootstrapping, okay, and I have sustained till now. Now, s since I want to take it to next label, new places, to new, uh, rather, customer base, Okay, so what will you suggest? Uh, again, a bootstrapping, angel, uh, going to some incubators and uh, ask for funding. Uh, this is one thing. And the second thing is, uh, this is a question. <clears throat> like, uh, if I'm looking for a place, or rather a country, mm. okay, so what should I look at? Uh, should I look at a customer base, a, a country which will give me a good customer base, or a country which provides me a good ease of doing business, mm. or a place or a country where I'll get valued, or valued in terms of like, uh, I'll get valued in terms of my product and my development. What, what, will, be the, what will be your experience? So I don't know anything about the product, so I can't really give you deep advice. But maybe I can give you some reflection. Um, I think on the funding standpoint, part of the question, the self-reflection that you need to do is, are you ready for capital? Right? Have you seen traction and viability in what you've developed? Right? Um, and why I say that, it kind of goes back to the, one of the questions we were talking about earlier, which is, should you focus on investment or should you focus on the product? Product, all the time, product, all the time. And when you raise capital, product, all the time, product, all the time, right? Uh, and, and so I think, uh, again, being responsible for the capital that you bring in when you're ready for investment or if you're ready for an accelerator or an incubator, um, what do you want to use that money for? And is the product ready for that use? Can it withstand scale? I think that's a, a reflective question for yourself. And then I think in, in terms of looking at other markets or other countries, um, again, I don't know the product, but um, I think the little bit of math that you were kind of describing is something that we went through um, with Kickstarter. So let me give you an example of our, of our plan, and plan of attack, if you will, for um, internationalizing Kickstarter. Um, first, we knew that going into a new market would have its own challenges that we just couldn't foresee because we've never gone to another country. Uh, and so an example of that was um, we knew at some capacity that Germany as a country, from a, from a transactional like finance fund transaction standpoint, was going to be very complicated. So let's not do that one yet, right? Um, we also knew that for the business, uh, being in another country would, it, would be its own strain on the internal uh, company on Kickstarter. Um, so again, how do we make that easier? Uh, and so we picked, uh, I believe it was the UK first. Why? They speak English. 
Uh, and so that made it just easier for us, I mean, culturally as well, that they were much more uh, similar in terms of the cultural norms with, between the US and the UK. Um, and some of the folks in, in the company knew that country very well. And so that was our first step. It was an experiment in understanding how do you open in a new country. And then we started pushing the boundaries a little bit more. We did Canada. Ooh, that's risky. Right? Not that risky, right? Uh, so we did UK and then Canada. Uh, and then I, let's, I don't, I, now I'm making it up. I don't really remember the history anymore. Um, but let's say Germany and Australia, right? So we wanted Germany because, okay, now let's, let's take on something a little bit more difficult. Um, so it wasn't always about the market size, but it was about other things that you can learn, right? Um, and I think if, if you take kind of a learning mindset to each stage of the, the early stages of the project, of the company, of the product, um, you'll get more out of that, that experience that you can get and then reflect into the next, next stage. So that's how I would go about it. Cool. Any more questions? Hi. Um, hi, Charles. No. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is that, um, how to get product market fit. For example, I have a product, so uh, I have, I'm a niche market, I have two to three thousand users, mm. and I want to go to second level. So we have some users, and how we can go to second levels. For example, once we have product market fit, and we have some uh, two to three thousand users. And my uh, second question is how we can use a Kickstarter uh, uh, while you are in this part of the world, for example, uh, can we use Kickstarter while you are in the Gulf countries? Or um, so I think with the first question in terms of product market fit, again, I don't know what the product is, so I can't really talk specifics. But um, I think it goes back to that obsession around your product and users, and listening and observing how they're using it. Um, which is simply to say, if you have a small audience using it, it may not even be the right audience. I think there's this other concept, which is your first audience may not be your big audience, right? They might inform you of which way to go, um, but your audience might actually be bigger if you start tweaking the, the product in a different way. So I think for one, you need to understand, like, well, who do you think the audience is uh, and try mapping towards that audience. Um, and if you don't have that audience now, looking at the current audience and seeing how would you get, get to these other, other people? Um, and maybe doing some experiments with the product to, to get to that point. Uh, maybe uh, explicitly inviting some of those people that represent kind of an image of that future audience that you don't have right now to use the, project, the, the, the product um, and seeing what kind of feedback that they have, right? Um, not about growth, but more about, again, a learning mindset, insight. Um, using Kickstarter in, the, in, in this region, um, I don't even know, are we available in this region? I don't know, it's been a couple of years since I've been at the company, so I don't even know. I mean, I told you yesterday about one of our startups who was in the other website, right? Yes, right. So I think it should be okay. I think so. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think you're going to know better than, better than me, right? I'm from the United States. I know how it works in the United States. And I think going back to that social experiment, each time that we launched in a new country, right, it was also a social experiment. There's always this question of like, what right do we have to be in that, that country? Um, what value, what, what value do we have in that country? Like what kind of, again, what's the job to be done? It might be different in one country to the other. Um, and by virtue of that, we, we're more successful in some countries and less successful in others. We haven't found that product market fit in, in some countries. So um, I think you'd probably be a better, better answer to me in terms of what would, what would work here. You okay, know? one more question here and two more questions here, and then we finish. I like the quota. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is uh, working on disruptive ideas and the new concepts. How did you deal? How did you deal or reacted to the naysayers, the disbelievers that have louder voices than you? Mm. So let me talk about the first naysayer um, that's got a louder voice than me, uh, and that was my father. Thank you. Uh, so his posit to me before we had launched, and I had kind of taken this path. I'd closed my studio, right, in service of, of focusing on Kickstarter. So it's not only a Middle Eastern culture. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. My father thought I was crazy when I dropped out of college. Uh, thought I was crazy when I quit my, com quit 
uh, my first job to start my first, second company uh, and then clearly didn't understand the concept of somebody giving money to a complete stranger for something that's not even made yet, right? I, I don't get it. Why would, why would anybody do that? Uh, and I was like, I, like, trust me. That's all I can say, right? Or I'll prove it to you, right? Uh, the irony of that is when I decided to leave the company, I thought I was crazy for doing that too. So um, I love my father, but maybe don't listen to my father. Uh, you know, I, I think in the same, on the same token, you see, you see the same question mark even from people in you know, the startup industry, community, what, what have you. Uh, other entrepreneurs, other investors, I don't get it. How is that going to scale? How is that going to make money? What's, the, what's your exit strategy? Uh, and um, I think you know, that process for, at least for the investors, it's a process, hopefully for them, of um, asking these questions to hear your response, to gauge, maybe I'm wrong. Right? Um, I've never seen the world through that lens. Um, but I think you're, you're constantly run up against naysayers. I mean, I think even when we launched, uh, maybe kind of going back to the, one of the earlier questions about the fight, um, maybe it wasn't so much about a fight, but it was about um, us making a different norm, a previous norm, feel very uncomfortable. We threatened people. Um, and they couldn't see the fact that maybe instead of threatening them, we actually augmented them. Right. Um, it's the hardest thing to do, and I deal with it now, even with lost arts, but you kind of have to ignore them. But you also have to be resilient, which is um, being able to fight through the depression, right? So I woke up this morning. Last night I had an amazing dinner. It was super fun, lively conversation. I was very excited. I was pumped up. Um, woke up this morning excessively depressed, right? Was texting my wife, oh my god, this is so painful. Like, how do I get up in the morning, right? Um, and then I get to hang out with you guys and, and be re-energized again. And so I think what that speaks to is you know you're going to get exhausted, but you need to be able to pick yourself up and fight through that. Um, and then surround yourself with people that also energize you, right? So if you get sapped of energy, right, which is exhausting as an entrepreneur, go talk to if it's your wife, is it, if it's an advisor, if it's one of your best friends, or if it's an investor, or I don't know, some random person that just has a smiley face on the street. Um, be around people that, that seem enthusiastic and support you. They'll recharge you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank you, first of all, for this informative presentation. Uh, my name is Samir. I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an HR professional. However, one of the challenges I could see in the, in the world that uh, most important things for any company is finding the best assets, which the, the employees finding the best employees most of the time. Mm. Another challenge is for the people or job seekers who's looking for best job. So it sounds like a good idea to be in between both of them and link them together. <laughs> yeah. However, internet is full of job portals. Yeah. Establishing a company that is online, mm. job portal. What is your most uh, um, uh, valuable three advices, may I say, to start a business in this field and be a successful, and what is the best source of money to target? Is this the employer or the job seekers? Let's answer the first question. I'm not sure if I understand the second question. Um, so let me tell you a story with, in terms of how I hire people. Uh, I use job, actually I don't even use job boards, right? Um, I do use LinkedIn, I use this uh, website, or used to use this website called Dribble, which is effectively a community, uh, online community of designers sharing their work, right? Uh, and GitHub, which is an online community of developers sharing their work, right? Um, and why those two communities are important to me uh, is they give me a lens into the, the character and quality of somebody's work, right? Uh, on Dribble, I get to see somebody's own design, and on GitHub, I get to see somebody's code, right? And so before I even reach out and talk to them, um, I have a sense of their capability, and maybe even a sense of their character, right? Um, I think there's another thing that I do, and that was um, I would look at Twitter, I would look at Facebook if I could see it, I would look at any, their own website, right? How do they personify themselves in public? Um, that maybe gives me a little bit of a glimpse of who they are and what are the things that are important to them. And then only if they sort of pass the test uh, do I invite them into my home, which is my office, uh, to talk to them. And in the interview, it's, I really just want to get to know them. 
right? I've already seen that they can produce good work. Um, I want to understand who they are as an individual, right? Personally, so that I can understand whether they would fit in culturally within the company that we're building. Do they have the same motivations? Do they understand that whole punk rock backstory? And do they kind of resonate with that in their own way, being the underdog, if you will, in, in the market? Um, I think within the realm of Kickstarter, um, we always did things a little bit differently uh, in that sense. Um, recruiting was uh, not a super speedy process for us. We cared a lot about how we ingested new people into the, into the company. Um, and, um, and so, I, yeah, I think, I think it's really digging into and, and discovering personality and personality fit. If you wanted to kind of take the ideas of product market fit, it was about cultural fit, right? And it was never enough just because you, could, you were an incredible designer or an incredible developer. It was an incredible developer or incredible designer that understood why you were doing what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a bad idea to establish a company since you're advising everyone not to go for job portals. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the thing with job portals is it's a job board, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of them, maybe to your point. Many, many, many job boards. Uh, and so I, what I would actually maybe push to do is how do you think about that matchup a little bit differently? Right? How do you, how do you think about the, the mashup as opposed to simply an announcement that I'm hiring somebody? Right? Thank you. Question? Thank you. Last question. Uh, I appreciate the talking in this session. I have a question. I'm a high school student. And, Whoa. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Uh, are you leading a commuter class, a lead, a group? So I'm facing a lot of problems in my group, like we're sharing ideas to build it. Yeah. But we are facing, like, some, some of them are not unsatisfied. Hmm. Uh, we want how I make, make their ideas uh, equal to build it. Is this within a, a team? Yes. OK. Um, is there a leader of the team? Yeah, me. <laughs> you. OK. So your job is to lead them towards something. Yes. Right. Um, and there's a bit of, um, would, would the word dissension? They, like, uh, they feel injustice. In a our, dispute yeah. amongst the team? Unsatisfied about the ideas we share. Ah. At some point, somebody needs to just make a decision and go with it, right? And if you're the leader, just need, sometimes the yeah, leader needs to be. but they will refuse to do it. That's the point. So they're, the yeah, yeah, they're all entrepreneurs, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, uh, too many cook, cooks in the kitchen, as we say. Um, <clears throat> you might need to be, break the team up, right? And look for another look team. Look for another team. I, you know, I think it's funny as, as we, we like to promote, you know, the spirit of entrepreneurship and, and whatnot, not everybody could be an entrepreneur because we run into situations like she's just described. Like, there needs to be people that enjoy, you know, not being the leader and working. And it sounds like you have a team of leaders, uh, which is, uh, are there, is there a team of leaders and doers or are there just leaders? I'm just a leader and I have a supervisor. I have a supervisor. Okay. A teacher of some kind, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the team itself sounds like more leaders than doers. Yeah, they have their ideas. They want to command. Ah, uh, <laughs> I think I think she's right. I think you need to find it. You're the you're the leader. They're all yeah. leaders. I think you need to collect a team of doers to execute How on. How I can equally to build it. So I think equally is never going to be. You're always going to make somebody unhappy, <laughs> and you have to be comfortable with making somebody unhappy. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you guys. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. It's been such a, a great pleasure, a great two days. Thank you so much for coming all the way. And we're so lucky that Qatar is the, is the first place you step in the Middle East. And I hope you come back again. I hope so too. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I just wanted to mention a little bit about Cubic for those who don't know what Cubic is about. What we do is we uh, support uh, uh, people with ideas or at the startup stage and we have the, the lean startup program we have um, um, we offer uh, so once you j we join the incubation program uh, we offer coach uh, coaching mentoring and also there's um, there's a seed fund involved uh, and whoever is interested to be a mentor please check our website there's also an opportunity for mentors or investors as well we have 
today we have 56 companies incubated, so they are many of them are looking for investors. So if you are interested, please let us know and join the website or, or meet the team, us and the team. Thank you so much.